uh, to my records hit the top of the hour. So welcome everyone who's just uh, uh, dialed in and welcome to our webinar on building a positive culture in the contact center. I think it's going to be uh, uh, absolutely fascinating, uh, absolutely fascinating to see. I'm absolutely delighted to uh, introduce you three great uh, uh, panelists on our webinar. I'm delighted to introduce Justin Robbins from ICMI in the US. Justin, thank you for uh, uh, joining us so early in the in the morning. Uh, I've been following your following your writing uh, quite uh, avidly. I've been reading some of the the articles you've written, like particularly like your technology article uh, you did recently, looking at what 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 is uh, holding people holding people back. But um, Justin, for the, those who aren't familiar with ICMI, uh, would you like to explain what the organisation does and your role within it? Absolutely. So ICMI started 31 years ago as one of the first organizations to offer contact center training. Uh, to this day, we still train many contact center professionals. Uh, we also offer events, but my role is running our community. So year-round, we're writing research articles, thought leadership, really just giving tools, resources, insights to professionals. Uh, so that's, that's what I get to do. I've been a contact center leader and uh, just love it, really, really love it. Fabulous, excellent. I'm also delighted to uh, welcome to you Jenny Corner from uh, Assurance Solutions. I first met Jenny uh, about uh, three months ago in uh, in Manchester, and I thought it would be absolutely fabulous to join our webinar program. So welcome here, Jenny. Thank you very much, Dante. I hope you're not regretting inviting me now. Um, no, I think <laughs> it'd be absolutely fascinating. And I, I think in our, our dress rehearsal, you've got some fascinating things to say. For, do you want to explain your role and what your, your company does? Yeah, so I'm the operational um, manager for Lloyd Banking Group for Assurance. Um, it's a global company um, that we're currently sort of focusing our attention in Europe at the moment, but I'm based in the UK, the lovely, warm UK. Um, but basically what my role is, is, is I wouldn't change it for the world. It's dealing with the, the, the front line, the people. And my job is to sort of make them believe in believe in where we're going uh, and what we're trying to do, and it's to try and make put my confidence and my my passion onto other people and make just make people actually wake up in the morning and want to come to work. Is what I would probably say my job is, oh. which is uh, easier said than done, but we're doing all right. Okay, fabulous, excellent news. We're also joined by Leon Stafford from Interactive Intelligence. Leon, welcome uh, today. Thank you. Um, what is your role within Interactive Intelligence and, and for people who possibly may not have heard of mm -hmm. uh, Interactive Intelligence, if you'd like to share that with our, our uh, audience. Yeah, sure. Uh, so um, the strap line for uh, Interactive Intelligence is um, deliberately innovative. We are a technology services organization uh, delivering um, cloud and premise-based uh, contact center solutions to 6,000 organizations globally. My role within the organization is I focus on um, financial services uh, and, and delivering uh, solutions to companies like Metro Bank, as I mentioned, or Fidelity Investments, organizations like that who are seeking to take advantage of the, the, the change in technology that is available at the moment. Fabulous. Well, I think we're going to have a, a very interesting, active discussion. Uh, if you want to uh, get a, a replay of today, uh, uh, callcenterhelper.com forward slash uh, recorded webinars. Just a reminder, we are running a chat room alongside today's webinar, and we do have a bottle of champagne or a box of chocolates for the best tip. If you'd like to use in our chat room, hashtag question for a question, hashtag uh, tip for a tip. Would be uh, would be very good, so we can uh, identify them. And uh, this is what the chat room looks like. If you want to get hold of a copy of the slides, you can do that from this link inside the uh, top right hand side of the of the chat room. So, but before we do that, what I'd like to do is I'd like to share with you a poll, and um, I would like to say what is the biggest cause of stress uh, that your contact center advisors face? Is it uh, uh, job demand and complexity? Is it high contact center or high contact vol uh, volumes? Is it unhappy customers? Is it tools that are confusing or difficult to use? Or is it broken processes or other departments that are causing the stress for the contact center advisors? So just like to uh, vote on uh, which of those you think is probably the biggest cause of stress for advisors in your contact center. That's just on the little uh, 
uh, box on the um, on the side of your screen would be quite fascinating to uh, quite fascinating to see that. So I think we've got most of the, the voted there. Justin, did you have a um, uh, a result you think would come up quite high in there? I, I did, and, and what's interesting to see is, is two of the three that I expected to see were absolutely there, but one of them, uh, one of them was, was not where, where I thought it might be. Um, you know, what's interesting is we, we, we did some research last year and asked the same question, and, and what we saw that uh, the, the demands complexity of the job absolutely was in the top three. Broken processes and other departments were also in the top three. Um, but when we asked this question, we actually saw that the tools that the uh, agents were using, often they had too many systems that were kind of stacked on top of each other, or they they were just kind of you know too complex. They didn't match to all the channels that they were serving. It gave them a disconnected view of the customer. Um, so this is interesting. This is interesting to see that two of the three were there, but the the tools and technology weren't weren't at the top. So it looks like the, the top two broken processes in other departments is probably the biggest single one on there, followed very closely by job demands and complexity. Uh, unhappy customers, I'd have thought that would have been quite, uh, quite high, but it looks like um, not, not so much. Uh, high contact volumes and tools, that also surprised me. Leon, I would have expected that to be, uh, uh, to be higher. Uh, you would have expected tools to be higher as a, as a, as a problem. I, th I think, um, I think, Maybe some of the people that are polling on this can identify that high contact volumes and unhappy customers are very much linked to the fact that they have broken processes or, or a high degree of complexity. So what we see in contact centers all the time is that agents are really handling a lot of the grunt work by navigating around their, yeah. their, internal, com, um, uh, um, their internal systems. Yeah. And they do a good job of making that invisible to the customer, but it's very stressful for them. Yeah, I can imagine. And Hannah said, uh, broken processes and ineffective systems are a headache for everyone. And Samantha says, for me, it was a, t a tie between tools and broken processes. We only allowed one. Perhaps we should have allowed more than one photon here. So that would uh, uh, perhaps rather change the, uh, change the uh, voting. Well, I'm uh, delighted now to pass the baton across to Justin Robbins from... Uh, uh, from ICMI. And uh, Justin, if I uh, pass the bat on the cross to you, perhaps if you'd like to share your thoughts about uh, improving the culture in the, uh, in the contact center. Absolutely, it would be my pleasure. Let's just put your slides up on the screen. There we are. There we go. Okay, so to you, Justin. Great, thank you. You know, so when I, when I, we had this initial conversation about this webinar. I realized that it's not uncommon for contact center leaders to really struggle with having positive cultures. And, and, and maybe it's not that you feel that you have a bad culture, or maybe you feel that you have a weak culture, whatever it is. I, I've really been kind of thinking about this a lot lately of what does it take for us as contact center leaders to build a positive culture because I believe that all of us want to have one. And so I really started with the question when I was thinking about this webinar today, I really wanted to a answer the question of why do we as contact centers tend to have weak cultures? And again, I don't think that we necessarily have bad cultures, but, but we don't necessarily have the strongest of cultures. And so I started thinking through this and, and what is it about the contact center that's really different from a lot of other places that someone might work in and other organizations who may have stronger cultures than we do in the contact center. And so the first thing that when I really started thinking through this is that few, if, if anyone, really grows up thinking that I can't wait, I can't wait to go through school to get my degree and go work in the contact center, right? None, none of us probably had that plan. We, we maybe went to, to get an education for something else, but th that job market was just not right for us or, or was difficult to find a job and whatever the path is we found ourselves here and so for our agents in particular who are working on the front line a lot of them are working in this this role out of necessity right it's it's, it's a job that they just had to take it whether it was the benefits the pay uh, a stepping stone into the company they didn't aspire to be a contact center agent the second part of this is that this job is changing. What what it used to be to be a, a call center agent um, even 10, 15, 20 years ago 
was very different from what it is today. We're, we're interacting with customers across more channels. We're using more sophisticated technologies. It's the roles really becoming from someone who's just a an order taker or someone who's working on repetitive, simple tasks. So much of that has been moved to self-service or automated uh, in, in a way that now contact center agents are, are more advisors. They're having to use uh, discretion. They're having to think through complicated or, or vague circumstances. And so it's becoming more complex. So we've got someone who maybe doesn't aspire or want to be there, working in a job that's getting more difficult, and then the expectations of our customers are increasing. They want that service to be truly unique, truly bespoke, so that they feel like we're their only customer, not one of hundreds or thousands or, or even a million. So you think about this and it starts to really snowball. It starts to become a bigger problem when you've got people who don't want to be there in an environment that's getting more complex and facing customers who, who have growing expectations. But when I started thinking through that, and probably even now when I'm saying that, you're thinking, wait, I, I already know that. This isn't new information to me. But the challenge then is that we've known this, and, and we know this now, yet we still struggle to create great cultures. And, and so how do we do that? How do we create great cultures in our contact centers, despite having people who maybe don't aspire to be there, despite having an environment that's getting increasingly complex and, and having customers who have heightened expectations of what service will be like. And and so I, I truly believe that there's three parts of this and, and, and I've developed what I'm calling really the work culture trifecta and the, the three things that I believe have to be in place and, and happening together for, for organizations to truly have the best cultures. And, and I think for a lot of us it's easy to have part of these or maybe do one of these or two of these really, really well, but it's the organizations that are, are really strongly adopting it and following all three that, that see the, the most success when it comes to really great cultures. And so the first one of those is purpose. The, the second is just general satisfaction with their job. And, and the third is with engagement. And so just to really talk about what, what it means for us then, because if you think about purpose, satisfaction, and engagement, it's up to the leaders, right? It's up to the leaders to set that. It's up for us, to us to model it and, and to really push these initiatives forward. And so the first of those being purpose. Purpose is that every single employee knows that they belong and they get that sense of belonging by, by alignment to your organization's mission, vision, values, and also understanding your customers' expectations. Satisfaction, really what this means for employees is that their basic expectations are met, basic expectations that I'm going to be paid a, 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 a rate that's fair for, for my local market, that I'm going to have the opportunity for a, a, a normal work-life balance, that I'm going to have the tools and resources to do my job, right? Just the basic expectations. Those are the things that satisfy us as employees. And I think we confuse sometimes satisfaction and engagement. And, and satisfaction, again, having those basic expectations of, of being able to perform the job met. But then engagement, and, and this I think is the hardest to nail down, is getting every person on that team to the, the point that they want to apply discretional effort to their job. I just last week was having a conversation with someone who works in insurance and, and she happened to live in a town where she found out one of her customers, their, their house was on fire. And she works in the contact center of this, but she knew one of her customers and she actually left her house at two o'clock in the morning to be with her customer by their side as the emergency department is, is handling it. To, to me, that's an engaged employee. And, we're, I'm not expecting this all to show up at our, our customers' houses or be there in that time of need, but it's it's wanting to go above and beyond and, and truly fostering that in our employees. So those are the three things that we, we need to focus on, and, and there's a lot there, and, and I realize that there may be a lot of questions, and so uh, I have my contact information. Would love to connect and, and help people dive deeper into that, but, but really it's about that, that sense of purpose, that I, I belong here, I understand where I fit in, that my basic needs are met, that I'm truly satisfied in, in my ability to perform my job and that I want to do more, I want to go above and beyond basic expectations. When we do those three things, then, then we see organizations have truly, truly great and strong cultures. Wonderful. Well, Justin, thank you very much for that. Some, uh, some great insights there. 
And uh, if you have any questions for Justin, if you'd like to uh, type those into the uh, uh, into the chat room now, I know a number of you are, are typing away as we as we speak. It would also be quite fascinating if you have any tales of discretionary effort, because I think um, you know it, it's something. I think that really is a, a good measure of um, employee engagement is the amount of discretional effort that people can do beyond just going to work. And it's hard when you're dealing with so many people. But if you've got any tales of that, if you'd like to put those into the uh, uh, into the chat room, that would be great. I'm just going to, sorry, you've got a, a tale there? Yeah, I've got a good one, actually. Uh, it's not a contact center one. It's Timpsons, you know, the, the guys that do the yeah. shoe repairs. Uh, they, I think they, when you go into their store, they, they, they've got a kind of printed document that says, you know, there's the CEO of the company who says, you know, my employees have um, my permission to, to do absolutely everything to deliver customer service. I went in the other day and they, they helped me to fix my um, my iPhone, which was absolutely not what they do, uh, but they were they were ever so helpful. I don't know why a technologist needs to go into a shoe repair place to get his iPhone fixed, but that's another question, I think. Yeah, and that comes right down from the top at Timson, sorry. So um, we're just going to do a, a quick poll while we're, um, uh, and we've got a question, quite a fascinating one here. When did your uh, senior management last go on to the contact center floor and start taking calls? Was it in the past week? Was it in the past month? Was it in the past year? Or have they never been onto the floor and taken uh, calls? So be quite interesting to uh, to uh, see this. Jenny, have you got a, a thought on what, what you expect the answer would likely come out as? Well, I'm hoping it's going to be better than what I'm sort of guessing because I've been on the phone today. <laughs> Well, well, wonderful. So let's have a look so at the. Uh, I, let's hope, have a look at, I hope the past month. I would like to make sure that we're staying in touch. Well, let's have a look at the uh, results. Oh gosh, doesn't it say something oh. interesting? Sixty-four okay. percent say they never have. This is a sample size of eighty-two people. Um, Fifteen percent in the past year. Twelve percent in the past week. Eight percent in the past month. So I think if there was one thing that you could take away from the contact centre today would be to invite your senior management down onto the floor to uh, uh, take calls. Often yeah, senior management feel they can't come down and take calls because that would be an imposition. And I've often found they actually uh, would relish the chance to come down and, and you know, it may only be three or four calls taking on, on the call or maybe not even taking them but listening into them. Uh, often relish the chance to find out what's going on in the organisation and quite a, a simple way of, of gaining friends and influence in uh, in high places. So I think uh, is quite a quite a fascinating uh, fascinating one there. Well, we're going to jump across now to um, we're going to jump across now to the the chat room. And uh, Rachel, if we can uh, uh, put your your screen up, and if we can see what's uh, what's happening in terms of the uh, conversations in the in the chat room, I just need to hide the hide the poll, which I. Uh, the lovely singer, John T. <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, <laughs> I've just got a high poll. In the meantime, Rachel, do you want to? Uh... Yeah, I'll just put my screen up. Um... Oh, there we go. Sorry. Right, we all see my screen. We can indeed, yeah. Fab. Okay, so Hannah said, uh, we've started to give our agents workplace massages once a month, which have gone down really well. Focusing on agent health and well-being is an important factor when trying to achieve a positive culture. Um, does, Jenny, do you, you know, do oh, you think lovely. that's... That is lovely. <laughs> where, where does Hannah work and how can we all go there? <laughs> yeah. I know. Someone oh, just come and just rub these a little bit. That would be lovely, I'd, I'd say. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, we've had uh, a question in um, from Holly who said, how do I keep an experienced member of my team focused and to remain interested in their role when there's no available further progression available at present? Justin, what would you say? Yeah, this is a really great question. So, you know, the, the question I would ask that employee really is where are they, where are they planning to go next? Uh, often w when we're in the contact center, in particular agents, it's a transitional role, right? No one really comes into the contact center planning to stay a contact center agent for the rest of their life. And this might be hard for some of us leaders to chew, 
Um, but we need to realize that one of the best things that we can do to help our employees stay engaged is find out where they want to go next and help them learn how what they do now will help them be successful in that future role. So their, their further progression might not be in the contact center, right? It might, it might be somewhere else. So how can what they do now get them to that place? And maybe it's even just mentoring a, a new coworker, and it's a new type of challenge that doesn't directly apply to their job on the phone uh, or whatever it would be. Yeah. Uh, Leon and John T, uh, what would you say? Do you agree with you know, Justin? I, ha I had something to offer there, which is also, so, so what, what Justin said, asking and understanding what they want and where, what they want to achieve, because sometimes you, you see experienced contact center uh, agents having uh, change and um, uh, progression forced on them when they're very happy turning up and doing their day job. So understanding where, the, where they see themselves and then matching a plan to that is really important. Um, Greg sent in a tip saying, I tried hard to filter all the crap from head office that is disengaging. <laughs> it's often a hard struggle. People are in an innately wanting to do a good job. Sometimes we make it too hard for ourselves. Um, John T, would you agree with that? Yeah, I think this is a key role in, in management. I think it's to act as the, if you like, the filter and to absorb the pressure. I see it particularly in in sales call centers where the senior management is going, what are you going to do about, about sales? And, you know, what are you going to do to bring this in? And that results in often quite nasty conversations where the, the sales team get too pushy. The best uh, sales leaders I see are the ones who can absorb that pressure coming from senior management to, uh, to uh, uh, produce results and able just to, to nurture their team and protect them from that, that stress and let them get on with doing their, their jobs they can do so well. So I think that's a, that's a, a, a great tip there, Greg. Yeah. Uh, Jenny, do you, do you often uh, try and sort out all of this? Is that part of um, your role? I'd definitely say I'm Queen Filter, to be honest. <laughs> um, but I think you need to. I think the guys have got enough that they have to think about, you know, the four different systems that they're using, the customers that they're dealing with. It's my job to try and make this, you know, you know, and the, and the management team that I sort of manage, it's their job to try and make this a good day. Um, and we can, you can do that a million different ways. I, I don't think it's a struggle, to be honest with you. I don't find it hard to do that. Um, we, we make it sort of, we're all, we're all a family. We're all trying to achieve the same thing. And it's, it's my job to protect the family, basically. And that's how I see it. And the managers feel the same. We're quite passionate about that. We'll deal with that bit. They've got enough to deal with. Great. Um, Michael sent in a tip saying, allow agents to use discretion. Even if they make a minor mistake, they'll learn from it. We need people, not robots, dealing with our customers. Justin, I guess that's a great way of sharing it. Yeah, you know, that's one of one of the biggest frustrations I hear from, from leaders so often is that they don't want to empower their agents or they don't want to give them that discretion because, well, what if they make a mistake? Well, then you get to really thrive as a leader. You get to guide and, and help this person move beyond that so that they learn and improve in the future. Right? We, we've got to expect that if we're going to have change, and, and we are going to have change in our contact center, we can't pull all of that weight as ourselves. We, we need to empower the front lines and giving them discretion. Absolutely. That's, that's a great tip from Michael. There's a few points there. Um, so, so uh, you know, being scared of, of learning from your mistakes is a real head in the head in the sand kind of culture. That, that we, it's very, very negative. Organisations uh, that are more progressive kind of actively encourage people to to document and be clear about their mistakes, so everyone can learn from them. You need to believe. You need to have confidence in your team. Because if you don't, then you know, how's it going to work? Great. Uh, we've had a question. Um, I didn't get time to uh, <laughs> write. So, sorry, whoever sent it in. It says, Justin, in our centre we're experiencing very low volumes. Do you have any suggestions for keeping agents busy or engaged during those quiet times? Yeah, you know, there's, I mean, depending on what you have in your contact center as other initiatives, you know, I've used that as opportunity to focus on more coaching, really just further develop and skill our, our agents. Um, even if you're thinking, okay, maybe we don't have time to coach, we've used it for agents to do lunch and learns, allow them to just share and, and educate their peers on other skills. There's so much that you can do. Uh, I mean, I've actually put together entire articles on, on ways to keep agents busy. It just depends on, 
on what other work you have and, and other things that you, you want to get accomplished. Um, but you know, sometimes also having that idle time uh, is a necessity to meet your service level uh, objectives as well. Um, so sometimes it is just being okay with, you know, do a Sudoku or whatever it is while you wait for the next for the next contact to come in. Okay, uh, Jenny, do you do you actually ever get low volumes, or are you guys always busy? Um, no, it's it's a constant it's a constant busy line to be honest with you. So we have to try and think of things that we can do in between the calls and the things that we can do when we do have um, that little bit of availability. So when that availability comes, we are ready for it with workshops, forums, buzz sessions. Um, I remember one team was just feeling really sort of they looked a little bit down. They were sort of doing some colouring in, which I thought, no, 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 we're not we're not nursery, we're not doing this. So we took the team out. We went for a run around the building. Um, <laughs> And I did it because we just needed some fresh air. We just needed to get the energy up there. Do you know what I mean? So just trying to make sure that whenever we do get those those little golden moments, that we take full advantage of them. Really, um, yeah. So it, it does mean you have to get a bit creative, but they love it. Brilliant. And uh, we've had a final tip here from Catherine, who said uh, allow operators to work not only with everyday tasks, but also giving special tasks to be useful for the company that will encourage to develop and probably have professional growth in company in the future. I suppose you could do that in the idle time as well. Uh, Leon, what would you say about that? Yeah, so we're seeing that um, there's a big, I don't know, I don't know if I'm half answering this and half dodging it, but there's a, there's a big uh, challenge in contact centers at the moment that are going omni-channel. So I'm, my, 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 my link to this question is people that typically have only ever done the same tasks, just been on voice, and now they need to do other tasks. They need to do some workflow items, some, multi, um, uh, some, some web chat, some email. And what we're seeing is that the feedback from their agents is that the variety that they get by doing multiple um, disciplines, multiple channels, uh, gives them a, gr a great deal of uh, job satisfaction. So if you're looking at different daily tasks, if you're able to wrap all of those tasks into a single view and a single queue, you can still maintain all of the um, visibility and the metrics around people's activity, but you're giving your agents a lot more variation and you're also giving your customers a lot of choice. Great. Um, so uh, back to you, John T. I think. Uh, well, yeah. Thank you very much. I think, Leon, that, that sums up in the old uh, adage that is variety is the spice of life. And I think when it comes to uh, work environment, variety, and certainly multi channel has a uh, an ability to do that. Yeah. It can be a bit frustrating, I guess, if the if the technology is often bolted together and it doesn't doesn't uh, fully join up. So um, uh -huh. I know a man who can help you with that. Yeah. <laughs> can be difficult. <laughs> so let's have a, a, a jump to another poll. Um, here's a quite nice one. Uh, the question is, what do you love about the culture in your contact centre? Is it the professionalism? Is it the buzz or the energy? Is it the training? Is it the management? Is it incentives? So uh, what is it you love best about the culture in your uh, contact centre? Unfortunately, you can only select one, one answer on here, uh, so it'll be quite fascinating, uh, quite fascinating to see. Jenny, what do you, what do you think is going to be the top answer? I hope, I hope it's the buzz and the energy. That's what my fingers are crossed for. However, any of them would be quite nice. It's quite a, quite a positive question. It'll be nice to see the answer. Okay, well, let's have a, a look, and uh, we'll put the results up on the screen. Yes. And indeed. 67% of people say it is the uh, it is the buzz or the energy. 19% say it's the professionalism. 5% uh, say it's the training. So if we've got any trainers online, then I think you've got your work cut out to uh, to raise the raise the standards there. And uh, Justin, perhaps you can help with that. 7% say it's the incentives. Only 2% say it's the management. So uh, I think we've got a, a a bit of work. Though I guess the management probably has a big impact on the buzz or the energy on the uh, yeah. on the floor. So absolutely fascinating. I think it's going to feed very nicely into uh, the presentation from uh, Jenny from Insurance uh, Assurance Solutions. So Jenny, if we can uh, pass the uh, the baton across to you now, if you'd like to share your shop, your thoughts on uh, building a positive culture in the contact centre. Of course, yeah. Um, so, basically, basically, can you see me? Are we all sorted? We can, yeah. Lovely, jubbly. So, um, I just want to say thank you very much as well for allowing me to speak about something I'm quite passionate about, really, which is the culture um, of what we do. Um, 
one thing that we strongly believe in, uh, I would definitely say in my department, is what I call the um, the bin man story, which is something that I tell all of all of the management, all of the agents when they come onto the floor. And that is that my granddad was actually a bin man, and it's not he loved the job, but obviously it's a little bit smelly. It's not the best hours. Um, it wasn't the best pay when he did it. Um, however, he said, "This is what I've got. This is my job. I've got to be here for eight, nine, ten hours a day. You know, that's what I've got to do." So I might as well enjoy it. I might as well make the best of it, and I might as well be the best bin man on the street. Hmm. Um, which is which is basically what I encourage the guys here. If you're a manager, if you're a frontline agent, if you work in the canteen, if you're an operations manager, you're here anyway because that's your job, and you're going to be here for the next eight, nine, ten, eleven million hours. So why not try and make it the best that you can, and be the best that you can, and take pride in what you do? So looking at the presentation of our culture. Um, the average age of the UK call center agent is around 26, um, and that they're normally looked after by management of older, not too old, as you can see by me, <laughs> um, and long-serving employees, which is quite nice about the call center, I find, is that we do sort of keep it internal, and those opportunities are given to those who put that hard work in from the very beginning. Um, and there are many myths about younger employees that can affect how they are perceived in the workplace. So, you know, you think that... You, you know, lack of strong work ethic or being only motivated by high pay or flashy staff awards. And I have written here in reality, um, actually they're eager, they're energetic and they're ready to take on new challenges. And we should encourage that creativeness and we should encourage them questioning processes and, you know, sometimes they're feisty, sometimes they're opinionated and I think that's fantastic and we should listen to them. Um, so I have wrote a little bit more there. I do like to waffle on, I'm sure you can tell. Um, but with this in mind, I wanted to share some of the examples that we do and some of the things that I've implemented um, quite recently. Because although the customer is our customer, I see my managers and the frontline agents as my customer. They're my responsibility. And if I look after them, they will then in turn look after what we need. Um, so these examples that I'm going to show you, the reason why I've picked them is they are quite small and they didn't cost us any money. And But they've had probably the biggest impact than when I've given away a plasma TV, for example. Um, so let's have a look. So what the first one is, Big Brother is listening. Don't be scared. Um, what this is, basically, is we have one or two managers in a room, the diary room. I'm not sure when everyone, you know, we've got some people listening across the world. I don't know if they've got Big Brother, but the diary room, um, these managers will listen to calls that are happening right now on the floor. So that is immediate feedback. We will then call that agent into the diary room and we will tell them how fantastic that call was, give them that immediate praise. Or in turn, if there was a challenge there, if we can give them some advice and even set them a bit of a task. Um, and it's something that we found is because it is immediate, the agent knows exactly what we're talking about. The manager is showing you know, that they are listening right now. And it also means that everybody is given 100% on the floor which in turn means our customers are having a great time. Uh, the agent found it useful. It's a proactive way of coaching. Um, and you know what? It's, it's making something that is quite repetitive and can be quite a difficult job actually quite fun, um, which I believe has, has, has made it a success. The managers enjoy it as well, which is great. Um, the second example I wanted to give you is something that we do is we did an agent forum where we said to the guys, you come into work every morning, how do you feel? You know, what, what's your frustration when you come in? What starts it off putting you in that sort of, you know, what can be classed as a bad mood? And they actually say when they come in and the keyboard won't work or the mouse is stuck or the system won't run. And they just, it just puts them in that negative frame of mind. It's quite frustrating. So we have a tidy and check Monday. So what we do is everyone is giving us a penny, <laughs> a duster, um, Dettol, wipes, and an IT checklist. So you can write any issues that you're having down and we give the place a good scrub. I mean, you spend more time in this office than you probably do in your own homes. So it's, you know, let's make it, you know, somewhere that we're proud of. Let's keep it nice. And I think if you have, if you are proud of where you work, you just naturally, you know, take pride in what you're doing with your customers. It's all about that, that, that mind frame. And I believe in it, you know, even our dress, our dress wear, we don't have dress down apart from on a Friday because we're, we're confident and we're proud in what we do. So we, we dress that way. Um, yeah. And Jenny, on, on that topic, one of yep. the, the things I see is that, you know, frustrations people have is often with things like the fridge. You know, you have a shared fridge, yeah, people bring it in and they, they forget about it. Mm -hmm. And, you Definitely. know, often, you know, clear it all out on a Friday 
uh, or maybe on the last Friday of the month. Anything that's in there gets binned. People are know in advance, and then it's all cleaned out beautifully and ready, so it's all all pristine, ready to go. Definitely, I mean that breakout room that we've got is for everybody, and it's quite. You know what? I'm not just saying this; it's spotless. We take pride in it. I mean, wash up after yourselves. I mean, it sounds the majority of the people that we take on can be quite young. I mean, we're actually. What I'm quite proud of is this is not just a call centre. We're actually teaching these people life skills. Some of them have, you know, just finally got the first homes, or this is the first job, or you know, they've come straight from college or university, um, and we're sort of we're encouraging them to, to dress correctly, to to respect where they work, um, and it's teaching them those those important life skills as well, which sounds sounds you know insane, but. You know, some of these people have just left the mum and dad, and they're finally learning how to sort of, you know, move on in life. And we're giving them them first steps by just saying, you know, look after where you work, take pride in what you do. Um, and it seems to be having a fantastic effect on the floor. Um, one thing that we found as well, we looked into that, when you hear your favourite song, you smile, um, you want to dance, you want to laugh. So we have a theme Friday. So every Friday we'll play, we'll have a different theme. So, for example, last week was Latino. So we played Latin music, Spanish music. It was just the, the atmosphere, the buzz in the room was immense. It was fantastic. I mean, we even had people salsa dancing in the breakout room. I've never seen anything like it in my life. <laughs> it was just fantastic. Why they're waiting for the microwave meal to ping on the on the microwave? Um, you know, it was wonderful to see. We have, you know, we've had an indie theme, an 80s, a 90s, um, and people are smiling. Obviously, we have to be a little bit, make sure that nothing is offensive. We have to play that sort of general music. But it just uplifts everybody, and you can't beat the Friday feeling. It's, you know, it's addictive, um, and it, people actually look forward to Friday. I mean, the past sort of six months, we've had zero absence on a Friday. Um, now, if that doesn't tell me that it's working, I don't know what does. People are coming in, do you know what I mean, which is... Which is brilliant. So, um, one of my favourite films. One thing that we are always scared of, I believe, is change. Something changes, and I think it's just natural to be negative or to question it or the change curve, which I'm sure we've all seen at some point in training programmes. Um, we try and get rid of that. So, we have one to ones, you have your, your return to work forms, they're all very tick box, just get them done, move on. What we try and encourage is that we change it every time. A one-to-one -one should be different every month. A team meeting should be held somewhere different every time. Think outside the box. You know, you're going to have to try and really get that brain in action. What else can we do different? What can we change? If that doesn't work, oh, well, it doesn't matter. We'll do something else next time. If that could be successful. Then share that best practice. Talk about it. Don't be scared of it. Um, now, one thing that we did is complaints. It's quite a difficult subject, I believe, and quite a, if you go into training to learn about complaints, how to handle complaints, it can be quite a, I'm not scared to say it, it can be quite a boring subject, quite a negative subject to discuss. So what we did is we created Space Camp. I was Captain Corner, and you had to address me as Captain Corner throughout the training. Um, if you were late, you had to do 10 star jumps, for example. Uh, and there was loads of things that are interactive in it. There was, you know, a little bit of David Bowie blasting in the background, you know, a bit of ground control, really putting you in that space camp kind of frame of mind. And your mission was to beat complaints. It was to defeat unhappy customers and make everybody on, you know, on the assured planet happy. Um, and if you accepted your mission, you went through the, the, the mission, the, the sort of the training camp. And if you come out successful at that training camp, you were given your own space camp complaints. Um, sort of card which you kept in your ID card uh, and it was talked about throughout the business people were actually excited to come and talk about complaints um, and it's just because we just tried something different I mean why not why, why not what harm will it do and the, um, the the impact was fantastic so they're just very small things that we've put in place that have um, had a massive impact not only on on the frontline agents but also encourage team managers not to be scared to give stuff a go and not to be scared to laugh and have fun. It's a very difficult role. It's a hard job. Um, and we're just trying to encourage that when you're not being professional with our customers and you're giving the best that you can, you can laugh if you like. You can you can enjoy where you work and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, so yeah, that's just a couple of examples. I could go on all day, but I won't. I'll stop. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to, to share them with you, to be honest. Well, wonderful. Thank you very much for that, uh, Jenny. And no Jenny problem. will be around as well to uh, uh, take questions as well that uh, you have if you'd like to uh, type those into the uh, into the chat room. So that's absolutely uh, 
Fabulous. And I think um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to uh, pose a question of everyone in the chat room, particularly um, tying in, into Jenny's presentation. If there was one thing you could change in your contact centre that would have an impact on culture, what would that be? So in one or two words, if you'd like to type into the chat room, if there is one thing that you could change in your contact centre that would improve culture, what would that be? We'll let you, uh, let you type that in. And while you're uh, typing that in, we'll jump across to uh, Rachel on the, uh, in the chat room and see what, uh, what comments, tips, questions you've had from the, uh, from the audience. Rachel, if you'd like to uh, uh, share your screen. Yep, it's been a hive of activity. <laughs> so uh, going back to a previous poll, uh, the one about taking calls, um, Brandy said, I take calls daily. I like this as it keeps me in the loop with what my team members are experiencing on their calls. Um, so uh, Jenny, I guess that's kind of what you were suggesting. That's brilliant. Well done, Brandy. <laughs> and Catherine says, uh, we listen to calls every day. Once a month, call centre lead work. Call centre lead works as customer support agents on the sp on the phone for one shift, morning, evening, night each. Uh, so that's nice. Um, Laura said uh, we haven't started a What's Matter group, allowing advisors to be open and honest about what isn't going well and what could be done to improve this. Uh, Jenny, ever thought about doing something like that? Yeah, we we um, sometimes we have something called the Voice where we nominate an agent from every area and they go and talk about it. Now, that's all well and good. So what we actually do after that is say, here's what you said, so here's what we did. So they can actually see the link and actually yeah. feel like, you know, you've been listened to, you've been valued, so you told us that you didn't like this or that you loved this, so this is what we did. And it has a brilliant, has a brilliant impact, even stuff like the positive part <laughs> that we've got <laughs> on the floor. <laughs> you know, put something in, to, you know, congratulate someone, say well done to someone, but... Um, I think being transparent and being you know, open, honest, and saying, you know, this doesn't work, you raised it, so this is what we did about it, I think that's what they love most. It, that creates a, a really good culture, I think, as well. I think the, the, the you, you said we did is, is a very, very powerful, uh, uh, powerful uh, uh, part of the process. We have got some answers coming back. We'll just jump back to, to Rachel in a minute. Uh, some questions about what you would change in your contact centre. Samantha said we would change the tools that our agents have to use. Brandy said we would bring in continuous training. Greg said that we'll uh, uh, need to have uh, more time to have fun as a team, which I think is, uh, is very, uh, very important. Um, we've got an interesting one from Daniel who said we'd like to remove average handling time as a, as a metric. I guess that's particularly at agent level. The good news, Daniel, is that on a recent webinar, we asked people how many people target uh, agents on average handling time. That's now that down less than 50%. So if you want to dig out that statistic, that could be quite a good way to show that your your contact centre is perhaps in the minority now. Um, Pete says we'd like to bring in fixed contracts, and uh, Jury has said I would like to increase skills through training. So um, I think quite a quite a range of different ideas there on what people would change to improve the the contact uh, centre culture. Back to you, Rachel. Great, uh, thanks for that, Junty. Um, we've had a tip sent in from Eric, who said, uh, agent buy-in is everything. Hold focus groups monthly to promote ideas and try to incorporate them. Agents will feel empowered and valued. Um, Justin, I, I suppose that goes back to the, the previous tip, actually. What do you think? Yeah, you know, absolutely. So often we make decisions that Im impact our agents. I mean, for example, if we were bringing in a new tool or technology, we have to make the decision without even asking the people who want to use it. I think the key here is realize that just because you're asking for agents to contribute their ideas, it doesn't mean you have to accept them, but they will be much more accepting of your final decision if they feel that they have had a part in the process. Um, and, and I, more often than not, have heard really valuable, great ideas that we ended up implementing just because agents are closer to it. They often have better insight than, you know, particularly if I'm the director, you know, I'm three or four levels removed from that customer interaction. Um, so if you want them to buy in, you have to get them involved. So, Leon, you were nodding there about uh, involving agents in, in technology decisions. Yeah, it's such a good point from Justin and Jenny there. But, um, uh, what I've seen is that when, when so a lot of 
a lot of people that are contributing are talking about a lack of tools, uh, a lack of um, necessary technology to fulfill on what they're trying to deliver. But quite often, um, uh, we see technology projects that don't uh, are not as effective as they could be because the the actual operational team haven't really been involved in the in the, in the selection and the creation of a, of a scope. Where I've seen it work extremely well was at Fidelity Investments, where their their IT team sat on the floor with the, with the agents and actively encouraged their agents to come in with um, uh, uh, with, with friendly user interfaces, ways in which in their in their in their lives at home they found an online journey to be very positive. Come into the office, share it with us, and when we're designing something, we'll take it into consideration. Although that's an excellent way of doing it. Great. So I Thanks. just want to add one more thing. So we did research last year about agent tools, and 92% of contact center leaders said that they felt their agent-facing technologies could be more effective. Mm. Right. Oh, yeah, not, not at all surprised by that. Yeah, yeah, we we see that we we see that all the time. So like your agents are your uh, they're they're a great marketing tool in mm -hmm. speaking with so many of your customers and prospects. Really, you, you need to you should be treating them. Uh, to all of the tools that they need in order to, to lead the customer successfully and focus on the, the customer experience rather than focus on the moving around of various screens and, and whatever else. Make it as easy as possible. Um, we've had an opinion in from Hannah. I like this one. Um, she likes Richard Branson's view, train people well enough that they can leave, treat them well enough so they don't want to. Um, great mantra for you then, Jenny. Yeah, definitely. I wish I had um, maybe a little bit of his money, though. That would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the questions we can ask him. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I'm sure he came up with that while he was sat on his island. Um, <laughs> but no, yeah, it's, it's, it's just the, the proof's in the pudding, isn't it? It's, um, well, so I say anyway that you can just feel it when you walk onto our floor. Um, they, these agents, these frontline guys are dealing with customers, you know, who are making complaints or logging claims or they're either doing something repetitive or something quite stressful. However, you will not feel that when you come on the floor. These guys are these guys are happy. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it, it's quite a, it's quite a strange thing, really. But every time we have a visitor that comes here as well, they say, wow, you walk through the door and it's like a punch in the face. Just the, it's like the air is thick. It's, it's a little bit much. You have to be a special kind of person to be able to... Um, be able to take it really. <laughs> Great. Um, we've had a, a question in uh, from Ine who said, uh, how often would you organize some sort of advisor motivation team building event in a busy contact center that deals with customers going through financial difficulties and when would you schedule them? Weekend after work? Jenny, what, what would you say? Um, well, each of our team managers will have their own sort of um, whatever they want to do with a team. So, you know, I know that they go after work sometimes on a weeknight. We try not to arrange things for other weekends with them because that's their time. We wouldn't want to sort of use their time for family, for friends, whatever it is they want to do. And we say that, we're honest, we say that's your time to sort of refuel and come back. But we would do things after work. We just recently had one where um, we went to a little bit of an event. We got all of our guys together after work um, and spoke to them about sort of, about the culture really, but about sort of what incentives that they like, what we could do better, what we do really well. I kept encouraging saying, you know, what do you actually like as well? You know, remember what you like about it. Um, it's not always about what you dislike. Remember why you're here. Um, and we did that after work. And then I know this sounds absolutely daft, but we went to play, we did bowling after. Um, <laughs> but they loved it. So stuff like that really is what we do. Um, we have, we're doing an event that we've called Bank Cella. Um, because we work for the banks, we've put a festival together called Bancella where we sort of get that we're going to get together and sort of um, have a sort of it's like, it's like a festival so we've got music outside we've got non-alcoholic beverages and alcoholic ones if you like we've got fairy lights everywhere and that's happened on the 3rd of June we've designed our own tickets our own posters and um, <laughs> because of obviously different people that we know my mum works in an ice cream parlor so we've got a big ice cream van for free a burger van for free it's not what you know um, <laughs> and hopefully I'll just motivate them just get them all together after work and just you know have a dance, have a talk, and just sort of you create them bonds and them friendships, and yeah. and then you you look you, it becomes your family. Then these these people that you're working with become your friends. We almost you know we're almost like a big gang. Um, <laughs> you know, there's, a, there's a battle cry every morning. 
I've done a, a lot of research recently on employee engagement. One of the best predictors of in, employee engagement is, is the question, do you have the best friend at work? Or if not a best yeah. friend, someone you feel you could confide in. And that's actually a very strong indicator of it, employee engagement because you know, if people have got friends at work, then it's not like going to work. It's going to see their, see, see their friends. And that exactly. really changes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the challenge then is to is to create the environment where people can have friends at work, particularly if you're chatting all the time on the yeah, phone yeah. to to customers. So it's it's creating that opportunity mm -hmm. to to explore each other's each each other's backgrounds and experiences and giving people time to to do that. And I think in a high stress contact center where you know you're talking that this question is specifically dealing with customers in financial difficulties. Uh, you know, you might need a little bit more downtime to, to kind of offload a little bit more of that and to, yeah. to you know, you, you're, you're kind of taking a lot of customer stress on. It's not an environment where you would necessarily want to be scheduling them to, to use every single minute of the day, otherwise yeah. people will kind of burn out eventually. Yeah, um, and scheduling wise, we went and saw Moo recently in their contact centre and they actually ask their agents to vote on what day of the week would be best for them and each time it changes, so make sure it's not always on a Thursday so that you're excluding certain people. It's a really good um, idea. Yeah. Greg sent in a tip which says, uh, we're using more and more think tanks to discuss future changes and help plan the rollouts. They're the experts sometimes and keeping some of them involved in decisions affecting their work has an amazing impact. Um, Justin, do you think the, these sort of think tanks would work? They do and so a quick story I want to share here is make sure you're not just using your best or your most tenured people when you're having your think tanks. You know, I typically, going back to one example, so we were implementing a new CRM, and so I had some agents involved. I made sure, though, I had really three groups of agents. I had really tenured agents who I knew did a great job. I had newer agents, but I also picked some of my laziest agents, and the reason I did that is when we're looking through that tool, my... <laughs> My, actually, my one lazy agent in particular had said to me, Justin, do you realize that if we would use that system, it's going to add an extra 10 seconds to my handle time? And going back to somebody mentioned handle time earlier, they're like, we know you're, you, you know, you're honest about how long it takes, and if it adds more time, I don't, I don't want to hear that from you. But what I also found is we were taking you know, several million calls a year, and that 10 seconds across every one of those calls, I would have had to hire more people if I would have went with that one system. And so... Make sure absolutely have that think tank, and I see the, the sum of in parentheses. Make sure it's a diverse group of people, and it's not always the the most tenured or you know the the most uh, kind of you know high performing that are that are in that group. Right, and uh, Leon, how would you suggest to help plan the rollouts then in technology um, wise? Uh, to be honest, Justin has captured my point entirely I think you know uh, if you want to know how to do something quick ask a lazy person because um, they'll find you the shortcuts I really agree with that <laughs> Great. Um, we've had a tip in from Michael who said uh, if you want to have fun or learning events let the agents come up with the ideas for contests themes etc this will ensure buy-in and be recognized positively as a bottom-up decisioning um, we've had a question in from Luke who said, uh, what advice would you have for a manager that's been recruiting, recruited externally to influence cultural change in regard to leading an older, disengaged workforce? When I say older, many of my team are 10 to 20 years older than me. Um, Jenny, um, what would you suggest? That's quite a difficult one, actually, because, um, you know, coming externally can be quite hard. Um, when you're internal, everybody knows what you're about, what your what your ideas are, what what it is that you're trying to achieve. Um, one thing that I did is because I come from sales to service, um, I would class that as external. Really, they were sort of like, who is this person? Um, and I would say that when I joined, I think sales and service are very similar now, to be honest. However, when I joined, it was two different worlds. Um, and when I came across, what I actually did is there was there's quite a few older of the old generation that work for us here in the call centre and they're probably my favourite to be honest because they just sort of come in, they want to do the work, they're never late, they're never off, they want to come in, do the calls and they want it in peace. However, you know, to try and get them, you know, influence that culture um, and sort of get them on board with me, what I actually did was just held 
um, the agent forum. So I booked out a meeting room um, and I just sort of invited at a time about five or six of those agents at a time to come into the room and sort of talk to them about sort of what I'm about, where I see us going, what, what I want to achieve. And I asked them what do they think. Um, I just asked for their thoughts and their opinion. And um, some of them actually said that they wanted to progress. Some of them actually said that they're quite happy where they are. Some of them obviously had a good old moan at me, which was brilliant. Um, it's absolutely fine as well. So, and it just sort of, I earned their respect really by just giving them that time of day and by just asking them what they think and not doing it in a group of 40 people, making it quite personal. Um, and and I, I found that really helped. Fan, thank you. Uh, John, to um, anything that you've seen? Yeah, I, I think I mean it's particularly difficult if you're coming in with a team much older than than you. You find this in a particularly disengaged team in, in a lot of in public uh, public sector where they, they've kind of been there for a, for a long time. And I think it, it is about um, it, it is indeed about earning respect. And I think as Jenny put, it's about asking and listening rather than rather than telling. And I think the danger is you can come in in this and you know talk all the management speak. You know if they've been there for for a long a long time, they've heard that before. Mm -hmm. So it's really about about listening, seeing what the issues are, and if you can have and not being too too fast on yeah. saying now I can fix that, I can fix that. Just listening, saying oh that's interesting, and then if you can influence some of that feedback, is to then say you know you said. I did, and try and see if you can build up that that positive um, that, that positive approach. You know, brilliant question, Ellie. I think as well, just on the back of that, is um, also by just getting on the phones as well, like we talked about earlier, sitting with them, taking the calls. If you show them that you're that you believe in it, and if you show them that you're you're a grafter, you're willing to work hard, they will in turn respect you and work hard back for you, definitely. Thanks, everyone. And uh, we've got one final tip. Um, share good news stories for the whole team of advisors when an advisor has helped a customer come through a difficult time or gave the caller a great customer experience on their journey with the contact centre and reward not just the advisor, but the advisors that are part of their team um, who are kind of sitting around with them. Um, that's a great one. Um, any thoughts on that, anyone? Yeah, I, uh, it's, I, I think what's what's interesting here is is, is there there are uh, there are ways of identifying the very best and the very worst contacts that are coming into your contact center. We're um, we're doing a lot of um, real time speech analytics at the moment, and I think there is a like with all, with all technologies, there's a way of getting really positive agent buy in to a new technology like real time speech analytics. Which is, you know, that the, their starting point, an agent's starting point, might be you're you're monitoring everything I say. This is a kind of draconian type of technology that is, you know, I'm under the thumb. But if some of the keywords that you're looking for in real time speech analytics are very positive, and you're trying to drill into the the attributes of a of, a, of an extremely good call, uh, and then you share that call with 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 everyone with with people's peers, and you reward them when things do go very well. I think it's a really good way of showing that this is a new technology, we've deployed it, and it's really benefited you in terms of your kudos in the center and your, 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 sort of, uh, your ability to progress. And I think it really is a, a question of uh, you know, finding, uh, finding someone uh, doing something right. And I think positive uh, reinforcement Correct. really does tie in very uh, much into that. Well, we've hit the top of the hour. Uh, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch a replay of uh, today's webinar, there's a lot of detail we've got here. It's callcenterhelper.com forward slash uh, recorded webinars. Um, if you could uh, put into our chat room in one or two words, what did you like best about today's webinar? Perhaps what was the, uh, the key thing that you've learned, maybe your key takeaway? If you'd just like to uh, type that into the chat room before we uh, before we leave, uh, we've got one uh, of our last of our summer series uh, in two weeks' time: ten ways to exceed your customers' expectations. And just finally, like to say uh, thank you to our three excellent panelists today. Thank you, uh, Justin Robbins from uh, HDI and ICMI. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. And thank you to uh, Jenny Corner from Assurance Solutions. Thank you, Jenny. No, thank you. It was brilliant. Thank you.
And thank you for joining us here in the uh, in the studio, Leon. Uh, thank you very much indeed from Interactive Intelligence. Thank you. And uh, thank you to anyone in the audience uh, who dialed up today. Uh, thanks for joining us. And if you'd just like to uh, leave your feedback in the chat room, what you like best about today's webinar, that would be great. Thanks, and see you again in two weeks' time. Bye-bye, everyone.